five, four, three, two. Thank you. Greetings, everyone, and good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for our second listening session for the Workforce Development Committee of the Law Enforcement Accountability Task Force. I'm Sharice Brewington Carr, and I serve as chairperson of that task force. And with me this evening is also Frank Burton, who is my co-chair. And we also have Representative Franklin Cook, who is one of the overall task force chairpersons. And I'm going to defer to him at this particular point to bring you greetings as well. Thank you so much and thank you everyone for being on here today. Very, very important that we uh, have this session and that I really appreciate everyone who's given 110% to this task force. And, and from there, I, I wanna get into the nitty gritty and get my listening on and uh, thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Frank. This is a uh, public listening session. So we want to thank all the members of the public as well as our committee members who have joined us this evening and we have a robust discussion for you. We have some wonderful experts that are coming to share knowledge with us about recruitment, training, development issues uh, nationally and regionally. And to head this off, we've asked one of our uh, committee members and our esteemed colleague, uh, Chief R.L. Hughes, who is the chief of police in the uh, great city of Georgetown, Delaware. And he is gonna be our moderator. Yes, yes indeed, Georgetown, yay for Georgetown. Uh, we, we're so grateful for his expertise and his experience and the other members as well. And so we're gonna ask um, uh, RL, as I call him, Chief Hughes, if he would start this panel and get going. And thank you also to our uh, guest this evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Cook, um, Co-Chair Frank Burton, thank you again for giving me and giving us the opportunity to talk about this very important issue. We are the Workforce Development, Recruitment and Retention Subcommittee of the Law Enforcement Accountability Task Force. Uh, we wanted to bring together tonight and talk about around that workforce development piece, really focus in here in Delaware, um, the standards for police officers um, is, is regulated by the Council on Police Training. And so we wanted to talk a little bit about that. And then we wanted to get a national perspective and so in order to do that, um, I was able to reach out to some folks to come in and talk with us tonight and share their expertise. And I will, uh, just for full disclosure, we had two other panelists. However, they are unable to attend. Uh, one son is in the hospital, cannot be here, and another was taken to the hospital this morning. So we, our prayers are with them that there are speedy recoveries for both. But we are very fortunate tonight to have two, two very distinguished guests with us. First, Mike Bacar from the International Association of Directors of Law Enforcement Standards and Training. Mike is coming to us live from Idaho uh, tonight. And I wanna read a bit for Mike because I think it sets up a little bit about uh, some of the expertise and the breadth of his expertise for us. Mike uh, became the director of IATALYST or the International Association of Directors of Law Enforcement Standards and Training uh, in 2012. Prior to that, he was the post director in Idaho. Now there's a paragraph from Mike's bio that I want to read, so please bear with me because I think it's really important to, to kind of see the, the flavor for this training. As the executive director of POST in Idaho, Mike was responsible for, responsible for basic training of all peace officers in the state. He was as well as county detention officers, juvenile corrections, adult corrections, and law enforcement dispatchers. With a central academy and two regional offices, his staff delivered over 1,800 continuing education courses throughout the state, attended by over 20,000 criminal justice practitioners. Idaho Post has the only academy in the state and is responsible for the training of all Idaho peace officers to include city, county, state, fish and game, juvenile detention, juvenile probation, adult correction, probation and parole, and state brand board inspectors. Post also establishes minimum standards for employment and issues 26 different levels of peace officer certification and classification based on job descriptions, education, training, and experience. Idaho Post manages a self-sponsored student program for men and women interested in law enforcement career. Mike partnered with Boise State University to provide a pool of police applicants to local agencies who have completed the basic police academy training and hold a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. And then lastly, Mike also oversaw the certified and certified three vocational law enforcement training programs at Idaho universities and community colleges. Mike has, uh, in his role as IATALYST director, has certainly seen and understands what's going on in the nation. 
And so he gets to see that. And we're going to get we're going to pull some of that expertise out of him tonight to, to help us with our discussion around standards in Delaware. Zach Herman is from the National Conference of State Legislators. Now, Zach and well, Mike and I share something in common. We, we started a long time ago in this field. Zach, not so much, as you can see, is a, is a young man. He comes to us by way of a bachelor's degree from App Appalachian State University and a master's in social work from the University of Chicago. He is a policy associate with the National Conference of State Legislator Legislators. He is a public policy professional with expertise in labor and employment. And so we asked Zach to come tonight because as I mentioned before we started our meeting to some of the other folks on the call, the NCSL, National Conference of State Legislators, has a very robust database around law enforcement. And it's, I would ask folks, everyone is hearing me, to please visit that because it is extremely robust and quite a bit of information. Before we go to our two panelists and talk with them and share some and have them share some insights, first I'd like to get an overview of our current situation in Delaware and talk about the statute here in the state of Delaware on the Council of Police Training. And to do that is Natalie is gonna be uh, discussing that with us and then Major Sean Moriarty who currently has oversight uh, of that uh, Council on Police Training may add in some comments as well. So Natalie. Thank you, Chief Hughes, Natalie Wallishan. I'm a house attorney and thank you to you and the rest of the panelists, um, to Representative Cook and the chair and co-chair of this committee for allowing me just to provide you a very brief um, overview of the two entities that concern law enforcement accreditation and training in Delaware. Um, we use a lot of acronyms, so I'll try, I'll try and explain what they are. The first one is COPT, the Council on Police Training. And that was established in 1969 by an act of the General Assembly. And it can be found in Title 11, Section 8401 of the Delaware Code. When it was enacted, it was um, entitled the Delaware Police Officer Training Commission and Program. And the General Assembly, when it enacted uh, that statute, explained the purpose for enacting the commission. And it was twofold. First, it was vital and necessary to public safety and security in these modern times to improve the administration of local and county law enforcement in order to better protect the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of the state. And to that end, it is necessary and feasible to bring about such improvement through compulsory and uniform education and training for persons who seek to become permanent law enforcement officers in Delaware. The second, Facilities are under construction for, purpose, for the purpose of providing a training academy for the Delaware State Police, which properly staffed and administered by the Delaware State Police could also provide much needed training for officers and prospective officers of municipalities and counties and other governmental units and agencies. The, at the time, for the, the commission was placed for administrative purposes only within the Delaware Highway Safety Department, which is a division, which was a division and still is, a division of the Delaware State Police. At, at the time of enactment, the, Del the Delaware Police Training Commission had six members, a chair appointed by the governor, and the rest were the Attorney General, the Superintendent of the Delaware State Police, the Chief of Police of the City of Wilmington, the Superintendent of the Department of Public Instruction, and the President of the Delaware League of Local Governments. And at that time, um, the statute required that any act of the commission, in order to be effective, had to be by unanimous vote. The powers and duties of the commission were to establish minimal, minimum sorry, education, educational and training qualifications to be a permanent police officer, a temporary or seasonal police officer, to prescribe standards for schools of police training and minimum qualifications for instructors to issue certificates of approval for such police training schools and inspect such schools and revoke for cause any approval or certificate issued to those schools. And um, the director of the Delaware State Police Training Division was responsible for administering the mandatory training um, and education for police officers. 
throughout the years, there has been some changes by legislation, but where we are now, it's uh, still in chapter 84 of Title 11, and it is now called the Council on Police Training, COPT. It is now 12 members. Um, it's the same five as it was in 1969, um, with the chair being by governor appointment. Um, and, but since then, the chief of Newcastle County Police was added, the chief of Newark Police, the chief of Dover Police, the secretary of education, one mayor or police commissioner of an incorporated municipality in Kent and one from Sussex, um, which are appointed by the governor and the chair of the police chief's council. There were additional duties that were added to the council since 1969. The, oh, the primary one was to suspend or revoke certification for for specific reasons that are outlined in the statute. Some of those being if someone is convicted of a felony or misdemeanor um, and, uh, and after a hearing. Um, there were some modifications to the minimum and in-service training um, and there are hearing procedures that are set out for the decertification. Briefly, a chair selects three members of the council as the hearing board to hear evidence on the allegations. The hearing board then submits its findings and recommendations to the full council in writing and for consideration and a vote. And the law enforcement officer has appeal rights to the superior court. Um, in addition to the statute, um, COPT is also governed by regulation. Um, and those um, regulations identify the objectives of the council to establish minimum pre-employment competency and police officer applicants, to establish minimum educational and training qualification for permanent police officers, prescribing standards for in-service or continued training and suspending or revoking certifications. There were, the in the regulations, there are some minimum standards for initial certification. There is an age requirement it is 18 for seasonal officers and 21 for full-time officers. There is also an education requirement, which is a high school graduate or an equivalency diploma, which is also accepted. The regulations permit an agency to have higher standards than those set by COPT, but very clear that they cannot be lower. Um, there, uh, the minimum training for police officers is 584 hours. I'm not gonna go into the weeds of all the training that's required and it's pretty detailed, or it's very detailed in the actual regulations, but there are some that I wanted to highlight because I think they would be of interest to this group. Two hours of constitution and bill of rights, two hours of training on cultural diversity and community relations, eight hours of interactions with persons with disability, and eight hours of police discipline and ethics. To maintain certification, police officers are required to complete 16 hours of in-service career-related training a year um, and mandated two hours every four years of detection, prevention, and prosecution of sexual assault, and one hour every three years of child sexual and physical abuse, exploitation, and domestic violence. Um, there is no, currently no website for COPT. The meeting information is on the public meetings website. The meetings are quarterly. The last meeting was January 12th of this year. The agenda was posted and for meetings, the minutes are also posted. I reviewed the, in preparation for this, I reviewed the minutes for, the la for about the last year or so. And in July of 2020, the minutes reflect that there was a discussion about a public website. Captain Sapp of the Delaware State Police made the request for a public website to hold COPT approved minutes and to include all decertified officers. In the October meeting, there was a motion to move forward to establish the public website, which was voted on unanimously by the council. The second entity is the Delaware Police Accreditation Commission, which is DPAC. And that was established in May of, of 2018 by an act of the General Assembly. And it's found in Title 11, Chapter 97. And the reason it was established is delineated in the, in the legislation. 
And it was because many smaller departments within the state don't have the resources or manpower to complete the regular, rigorous standards issued by the Commission on Accreditation of law enforcement agencies and public safety departments would be better served by a statewide accreditation. DPAC has six, at the time it had 16 members, all appointed by the governor. They had specific functions and that was to develop a statewide police accreditation program, develop standards for police accreditation program, promote cooperation among state, municipal, university, and DRBA police agencies in addressing statewide accreditation and to provide recommendations to the governor and the General Assembly concerning issues related to state level police accreditation standards. In 2018, DPAC was amended by statute by the, by the General Assembly and all that, all that uh, legislation did was change the composition of DPAC it changed it from 16 members to 12, removed some members and added the secretary of the Department of Safety and Homeland Security who serves as chair but cannot vote um, and except to break a tie. Information about DPAC can be found on the Department of Homeland Security website and the uh, public, meeting, uh, public meetings are posted on the same public meeting website there was a meeting in January 19th of, 29, of 2021 and uh, the virtual meeting link was provided an agenda was posted and the next meeting is March 16th of 2021. Th thank you, Natalie. Um, Major Moriarty, anything, anything uh, that was very comprehensive, Natalie, thank you very much. He does, gave a very good overview of the two entities within Delaware that are around the training and then the policies and procedures and policies for our law enforcement agencies in Delaware. Those are the two governing bodies, if you will, um, that have a responsibility there. But uh, Major Moriarty, specifically around uh, COPT, anything that you wanted to add or think we should add in for the discussion before we start? Well, first, thank you, Chief. First and foremost, uh, I think that it's appropriate we talk about law enforcement accountability that we also think about law enforcement in general and uh, I know that our, our thoughts and prayers with the two FBI agents who were killed today, along with the others who were shot just north of Miami. Uh, I know that's uh, certainly near and dear to uh, Pastor Burton, but to, to all of us and uh, the officers' families as well, as we uh, constantly reminded of the danger that affects us all uh, and the public service that we're doing, especially for that type of crime that they're investigating involving children. Uh, that being said, uh, I want to say, Natalie, what a great job uh, of going over those two entities. Uh, fantastic uh, going through those. Uh, as the discussion you know, continues, we'd be happy to address any specific questions that we have, whether it pertain to curriculum or what have you. Uh, but great, great job laying that out. And then, of course, as the chief started the conversation today, we got to think about the, the national entities that help us. Certainly, uh, IABUS is phenomenal. Uh, and CALEA, uh, the national accreditation that governs us in addition to Delaware specific. So most of the larger agencies obviously are, are governed by those rules and regulations and accreditation standards. So that being said, uh, uh, I'm here for any questions that I can, can uh, answer. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Major. So let's, uh, let's start a discussion with, with Zach. So we're gonna follow up. I would like to follow up with Natalie's um, and, and Sean's comments around the, the statutes and those two governing bodies here in Delaware. Zach, if you would, if you could just, well, first off, just tell us a little bit about the NCSL and your database, and then give out any disclaimers that we need to around the information, and then maybe just talk about that a bit. Uh, of course, thank you, Chief, Ho Chief Hughes, and uh, thank you again, uh, Chief Brewington Carr, or Chair Brewington Carr, Chair Burton, um, and Representative Cook for having me on today. Um, so the National Conference of State Legislatures, NCSL, is a membership organization for state legislatures and their staff. So we serve both the legislative bodies, the legislators themselves, and their staff. We provide um, unbiased, nonpartisan policy research, as well as technical assistance. Um, it's important to note that NCSL does not take any policy positions. We don't write model legislation, and we do not push any particular policy perspective. We just provide the details um, and provide the research and then let our members make their own decisions. Um, what we focus on is also driven by our members as well, so the state lawmakers. What they find most interesting or most important is what we direct our research towards. Um, so with that, uh, we just published, I think, two weeks ago, our large 50-state statutory database 
on um, all statutes related to police officers. Um, it is nearly complete. We are in the process of adding data related to collective bargaining, LEOBOR, so uh, Law Enforcement Officer Bill of Rights, and um, uh, oversight data, oversight regulations generally. It's important to know that this 50 state scan is statutory in nature, so it is not looking at regulations brought forward by post boards or other regulating agencies. It's only looking at statutes written in state code that relate to 12 different topics for police officers. Um, so that includes data on use of force standards, legal duties and liabilities, so that includes duty to intervene, uh, certification state requirements, decertification requirements, uh, use of force investigation, qualified immunity, training, use of force data collection, and traffic stop data collection, along with the incoming collective bargaining and um, law enforcement officer bill of rights. Um, you can find this database on our website under our criminal justice research page. I work in partnership with two of my colleagues, one, uh, Susan Frederick, who works on the federal affairs side of criminal justice, and then my colleague, Amber Widgerty, who works on the state level criminal justice policy research side. I cover the employment aspects of sort of law enforcement and police officers generally. Um, so with that, I'll be talking about sort of what we have relating to the 50 state statutory scan for training. Um, and then I can also answer questions about uh, decertification or certification as well. That's sort of my uh, wheelhouse within this project. Um, so for the law enforcement training, what we're seeing, oh, sorry, we also have a companion database, which is our legislative tracking database. We have a weekly updated legislative database that tracks um, all sort of bills introduced related to law enforcement officers generally, so not just accountability. Um, and currently there are about 700 bills that we're tracking just in this first month of sessions being in. Um, and then for this subcommittee as well, I can uh, release our enactment summary for 2020. Um, so those are sort of the things that I'll be pulling from for this panel. Um, I think a general overview of what we're seeing related to statutory training requirements is that sort of if you have a state, you have a way to talk about and, and regulate training requirements for police officers. Um, there is no one standard or one model that we're seeing pop up across all 50 states. Um, there are two states in our scan that have no statutory training requirements that we could find. Those states are Alabama and Mississippi. Um, we organize the, the training requirements into um, five broad categories. So that's cultural and racial bias training, training related to physical and mental health conditions, training related to special populations and use of force training. We also have other an other category, and this is where we'll put um, statutes related to warrior style trainings, uh, trainings related to crowd control or to um, protests or things like that. Sort of the one or two states have this, but, it's, but there's not enough states to create its own category. Um, then I think in general, giving a broad overview of both the legislation that we're seeing in 2021 and the le enacted legislation we saw in 2020, Related to training, the bulk of it is um, bans on either specific kinds of training, so bans on warrior style trainings or bans on um, trainings related to chokeholds and uh, chokeholds or, or restraints that may cause unconsciousness. That's sort of the bulk of what we're seeing or states uh, in statutes specifying what trainings are required for all peace officers, all law enforcement officers across the state. So that could be sort of going into the nitty gritty of six hours in this course, recurring six hours in use of force, another four hours in chokehold specific, that sort of thing. And so states sort of um, getting into the granular and writing those statutory requirements. Well, so Zach, let, let me stop you for just one second because you, you brought up something that um, we have talked about before as a committee, or, or maybe it wasn't on this subcommittee, but maybe it was in the larger law enforcement accountability task force meeting, was that warrior. You talked about warrior uh, style training. And so, Mike, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring that over to you because I know you and I had a, a, a discussion about that on some, what you're seeing nationally from a training standpoint on uh, at academies, police academies throughout throughout the country. And I know we talked a little bit about that, the warrior versus guardian. And when I heard Zach mention that, I, it was a perfect segue into letting you talk about that a little bit and some of your feelings there and what you've seen over the years. Um, that's kind of a, a misnomer. Um, people get, get really confused about that. Um, but because a, a, a well-trained police officer uh, should be a guardian 
a guardian of the Constitution, a guardian of the, of the uh, citizens they serve, but they also have to be a warrior at times. So they have to be trained in defensive tactics, they have to be trained in firearms and things like that, but they don't go out with a warrior mindset. They go out with a guardian mindset. And if the situation escalates to the point where they have to take control, then, you know, in, in those words, they become a warrior. Um, I don't like to get hung up on, on those terms. I know they're tossed around a lot. Um, we've had a lot of academies that have revised their training because officers were going out with that mindset uh, that everyone was against them, everyone was the enemy, things like that. Uh, some that referred to as a warrior mindset. And that's very problematic. Um, some of the academies that have changed their training because of that and adopted a guardian um, mentality, then they got criticized, well, you're, you're training a bunch of pansies that, that aren't gonna take any action. And that's not the case. So you have to be really careful with the terms. Um, and, and I don't like that the misnomer, but I know that, that academies now across the nation are uh, really gearing up on constitutional law, community relations, how to blend in with the community and um, work with the community, uh, racial awareness, uh, biases, bias training, uh, all those things um, we're seeing because of, of a lot of the developments that are, that are going on nationwide. Uh, that's kind of the trend that's going on now. And, um, and, and that's referred to a lot as, as the emphasis on um, at least the guardian mentality uh, when officers go out there to hit the streets. Thank you, Mike. Zach, I didn't mean I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to. Kind of, it was a, seemed like a good time to have that. So I'll, I'll toss it back to you to talk a little bit more about your uh, your study. Uh, yeah. So um, coming out of this study, we'll be continuing to add data to the database. Um, we'll also be doing a larger trans piece and legislative review coming in May once most of the legislatures are out of session. Um, and then this project is funded by a, a grant from the Arnold Ventures Foundation, which is working on this issue. Um, they have their own sort of policy goals, but um, we as NCSL don't contribute to those policy goals or anything like that. We're just here to sort of provide data and technical assistance uh, related to this topic for the states. Um, and so that's what we'll be producing going forward with this database and uh, with the tracking that we're doing and the companion database and legislature. So thanks, thanks, Zach. So, so with all that said, Three key words come out of our this work group and the Law Enforcement Accountability Task Force. And in many of the circles of the, the Delaware Police Chiefs uh, Council is accountability, transparency, and culture. And I know you and I had a discussion talking about some of the reform things that you're seeing throughout the country. Can you, can you kind of talk a little bit about what you're seeing? And I know you listed out those five categories, but can you talk a little bit about what, I know you don't have a policy position, but could you point us to an area that might be a good idea for us to take a look at a, a particular state? Uh, yeah, so looking at our legislative tracking, I think some of the states that are um, making some of the sort of uh, big moves in this area right now are Colorado, Utah, Connecticut, and uh, Virginia, and Vermont. Vermont is not necessarily making moves in the training space as much. Um, we're just not seeing... Uh, they're making some moves, but they're not making as sort of big a moves as like maybe Colorado was. Um, I think the two that we get the most questions about from our members generally are Colorado and Connecticut, who um, passed pretty sweeping legislation that included um, publicly available databases for decertification and discipline. Um, that's both publicly like published and publicly sortable. Um, and we get a lot of questions about that as sort of the, where the data is, where the data is going, who's collecting what. Um, we're also getting questions in general about um, sort of decertification and certification in relation to officer conduct. Um, and then that also ties into training a little bit of how are these officers trained? How are they certified? How are they regulated? How are they investigated? Um, all of those sorts of things. And in general, it's interest from the legislature looking to sort of increase its role and in, in, uh, directly in the state directly regulating all police officers in the state, as opposed to um, the way it's currently done, which is more states set the broad picture and then it's delegated down to um, local authorities, localities and post boards. Um, and so instead setting in statute and standards is what we're seeing a lot of. 
Um, again, sort of in training, the main pattern that we're seeing is either that um, one side, which is what uh, Mike Becker was talking about, building out the training that a police officer does. So training on de-escalation, training on working in um, crisis response teams, training on uh, anti-bias training and those sorts of things, or it's uh, banning certain types of training. So banning uh, use of certain use of force, especially ones that are chokehold related. And so some of those are broad, they just say the word chokehold, um, but then others like Utah specify specifically which types of chokeholds are allowed versus not, and which, uh, which types of chokeholds police officers are allowed to be trained on versus not. Um, that can also be seen in uh, sort of Virginia legislation, which is about minimum level of uh, training across the state. So these are the minimum sort of standards that everyone has to be trained on across the state and the topics that they have to be trained on in the hours. Um, then sort of past that, uh, it's broader transparency legislation related to both oversight and data collection. So who's take, collecting the data? How is that data being shared? Whether that's externally, how is the data being shared with public relating to how the police officers are trained, how they're certified, how they're investigated, or internally where um, there, there may be certain restrictions on how uh, an officer who's decertified or disciplined, how those records can be shared even with other police departments. Um, and so there are then bills that are coming forward sort of opening that process up so that uh, agencies have more ability to do those sort of checks on the new officers that they hire. Um, one of the concerns that we hear from our members generally is that uh, a police officer can be decertified in one jurisdiction, move over, and then be certified and hired in another. And there's no real way for them to check what happened unless it was like on the news or something like that. Um, and so we're seeing more sort of legislation opening up that transparency internally as well. Um, yeah, and so that's the sort of broad overview that we're seeing. I think that and then just well, tying training and certification together a little. Yeah, you bring up some, a couple of very good points. And you know, I was taking some notes, Zach. So, Mike, I'm coming over to you because I heard decertification uh, talked about a lot there and sharing that information. So I do have a list of questions, but this, this was on there, but it was further down the list. But, Mike, could you talk a little bit about the NDI? Yes. Um, and, and, Zach, uh, when you said um, the, the public concern because uh, when an officer is, is decertified, there's no way to find out if that officer is decertified. We've run the National Decertification Index for 20 years. We have every state in the United States listing all decertified officers in the NDI, except for four states that have no decertification authority. They don't decertify, so they don't contribute. Um, but right now, uh, as of today, there's over 29,000 actions of misconduct in the NDI. Um, provided by 46 states or uh, decertification bodies. We've run this for 20 years. Uh, we started it in uh, about 2000. Uh, and it, it's taken that long to get every state to contribute. A lot of states had to get legislative authority. They had to get uh, their attorney general to authorize them listing. But all the states are contributing. We just received a, a large grant from the Department of Justice this came down because of the President Trump's executive order, uh, but the grant is to redo the NDI, uh, which we're in the process of doing right now, um, where we're going to give the ability to list officers that have been terminated but not decertified for excessive use of force that have gone through due process. That's, that's the kicker here. They have to have been gone through due process. Uh, we don't want to get into listing officers who just have complaints against them. Um, and, and that's a personnel issue by an agency. But if they've been terminated uh, for misconduct, we also list uh, officers that are under investigation for decertification investigations, because sometimes that takes a year. Um, but anyway, this is a, a free service that we offer to every law enforcement background investigator to be able to query the NDI. And, uh, as of today, there's probably 7,000 uh, background investigators that now have query access to the NDI to check to make sure if an officer's decertified before uh, they hire an officer that comes in from another state. So we're trying to um, stop those, de those decertified officers from 
uh, getting employment. Um, where they slip through the cracks is small agencies that don't do a good background and don't access the NDI. Um, and, and sometimes we don't find out about it till later when the state goes to certify those officers. Usually the states will uh, check the NDI and find that they're decertified. So we've had some cases like that where they've had to terminate the officer, but um, it's making a, a tremendous impact nationwide. Um, a lot of people are calling for a decertification database uh, only because they don't realize that IATLAS has, had, has that and has it in operation for a number of years. Yeah, th thanks, Mike. And I think Zach was referring to there's no, no state statutes that require that. And perhaps that's something, well, I'm just a moderator. I'm not going to suggest anything. I'm just the moderator. So, but there's no state statute that requires that to, to Zach's point. Um, and that's, you know, I might say- no thing. There's no public access. And because, you know, what we're hearing is that this, you know, there's 7,000 background investigators that have access to it because there is a personnel reason. In other words, a, a human resource training or something that they're asking for that. But I think what we're hearing is that the general public feel that they have a right to see that. And I think that if I may call in, Mike made a very good point where there has to be a due process in this. It just can't be an accusation or something else. And, and so, but I think that the public, some of the public feel they have a right to see that because they can go on a database and find a sex offender. They can find other stuff. Um, that has been through adjudication, which may not be the entire case with an employment related issue. Right. And Mike, may I ask you a question, uh, if I may? So in the decertification of police officers and you have a database uh, of those, you know, how extensive is, is that uh, a problem uh, for people losing for cause? and? Well, do, you, uh, do you have, I mean, do you have the statistics on that? Uh, not specific sp statistics, um, although we can look at, at how many entered every year, but um, it, it's hard to measure because about half of the states uh, certify and decertify correctional officers. And what we're finding is correctional officers sometimes are, are decertified for misconduct. Uh, twice as much as law enforcement officers. So that kind of skews the data. Some states uh, decertify and, and or, or certify and can decertify um, dispatch personnel, uh, parole and probation, just a whole multitude. And so any of those states that decertify, those are entered into the NDI. Um, as far as what, what's collected, it's um, officers that have been decertified for misconduct whether it be a felony conviction, a misdemeanor conviction, or in many states they can decertify for uh, a violation of the code of conduct, things that are not criminal, like dishonesty. Um, we also have uh, relinquishment, court-ordered uh, relinquishments, uh, court-ordered uh, suspensions, um, some uh, post-suspend. Uh, and then reinstate, uh, those are all entered in there. And then when the reinstatement, uh, there's a record of that. Uh, it, it's pretty inclusive, although with this new grant that we just got and the executive order, we're looking at including a lot more things. Um, on the public um, database, misconduct databases, I know that many states are, are developing those databases and I'm, I believe those will be open to the public. Part of, um, and, and I, I hear what you're saying about the public can go on and, and find sex offenders uh, because they don't want those kind of people in their neighborhood. But think about a decertification. When I think about that, why would the public want to run an officer? Number one, probably because an officer gave them a citation or made an arrest and that uh, upset them. So the first thing they want to do is go in and see if that officer's in the, in the index. Well, that officer's not going to be in the index because they're hired, they're working, they're certified. Um, so the only officers that are in the index are officers that are not working, that, that uh, have been decertified, they can't work. Um, and so it's more of a hiring uh, situation in this case. Um, if we had a, a state that was tracking um, 
complaints against an officer and things like that, then yes, uh, that's something that uh, I think would be more searchable by the public. But anyway, that, that that's not um, that, that's kind of the feeling that has uh, been in the past is why our uh, NDI is not open to the public. That could change. Uh, everything is on the table right now as we redevelop it uh, based on that executive order. Thank, thank you, Mike. Thank you for that question, Dr. Farley. Um, so Mike, when we talk about, uh, I'm gonna skip back because I, I kind of jumped over some in the beginning, Mike. I just wanna come back to first, and I should have done this first. Tell us a little bit, tell us a little bit about iAtalyst. Just to give okay. us a, a quick overview, and, and then I think that will actually lead to some more questions as well, but it, just give us a quick, quick overview of, of iAtalyst. Sure, I, iAtalyst is a nonprofit membership organization. We're made up of all the state posts, the Peace Officer Standards and Training in the United States. Um, your state is a member. Uh, Major Moriarty is a member um, of our post. Uh, of our of IATLAS. We also have um, a majority of the training academies in the United States as members and a lot of trainers. So basically what we do is we share information. Uh, we, we share best practices. Uh, we do research and development um, and try to uh, put out best practices. We can't mandate to any post um, what they set as standards, how their post is, is established, um, things like that. It, it's all done by each individual state, but we develop model policies that we put out that states can try to uh, adhere to. And our model standards include post administration, how a post is set up, the commission, how it's made up, uh, our suggestions for that. For peace officer selection, we have all those standards that you talked about, vision, hearing, age, um, so forth, military record. We have standards for recruit basic training, in-service training, instructor training, and professional conduct, which includes certification and decertification. We actually have four or five states that have model decertification legislation that we actually list in our model standards and they're available on our website. Um, some of the other things we do to help out the various posts, we, we not only run the National Decertification Index that I talked about, we uh, run a program we call NCP, National Certified Program Training Program, of uh, vendors that come in from out of state that offer training programs. Some are very good, some are very poor, and everything in the middle. Um, the posts used to certify those out-of-state training most of them wanted out of the business because they didn't have the time, they didn't have the expertise of the personnel. So we developed the national certification program where we have experts that uh, run these training programs through a matrix to find out if they meet all the standards of all 50 posts in the United States, that they are best practices, that they're defensible. And if we certify them, then all 50 states accept that training. We, um, we run accreditation. So you talked about uh, Delaware being an accredited, uh, has an accreditation uh, agency to accredit law enforcement agencies uh, because CALEA is so expensive. Um, IATALYST accredits posts, no one else accredits posts. So we'll go in and accredit a post organization. And because of that, we also offer academy accreditation uh, because our posts oversee academies, some of them oversee uh, hundreds of academies, such as Florida, California, uh, Texas, some of those bigger states. Uh, that, and so we have that expertise. And so we also accredit academies, not only nationally, but internationally. We have 18 countries that are members of IATALYST. These are training directors in those countries, and we're doing uh, academies internationally as well. We also audit uh, posts. We've had posts come to us and ask that we audit their procedures, that we audit their programs, that we audit their training for best practices and so forth. We've done audits in Colorado for their posts, uh, Vermont for their use of force training, uh, for the state of Missouri on their operations. We're also doing an audit of the Charleston-Mecklenburg Police Department training 
to find out uh, if it's best practices, if, it, if, it's, if they're utilizing all the current most available types of training, how their recruits and their in-service training um, matches up um, as well as their lateral entry. So uh, we're in the process of doing that. We also um, in certify national instructors that meet our qualifications on a national level. And we also certify international uh, instructors. So those are a, a few of the programs that we offer uh, for our members. So um, Mike, I just want to turn our attention a little bit to you talked about post, so police officer or peace officer or police officer standards and training. Uh, we talked about here in Delaware, we have the Council on Police Training. Right. Kind of sort of the same thing. We're calling, you know, a little bit, a little bit different, a little tweaking here and there. From but you're what do you see nationally, Mike, when you when you look at these peace officer or police officer standards and training bodies, entities, what what do they look like? How are they structured? <laughs> They're all different. Um, and, and we've referred to them as POST, Peace Officer Standards and Training. Um, your uh, COPT is, is a POST in our uh, uh, definition because you do set standards for training and you set standards for hiring. All 50 states do that, but they're all structured differently. Um, some of them are standalone agencies. That's our recommendation. Um, some of them fall under um, the state police or highway patrol, like Delaware, Pennsylvania, uh, Rhode Island. Some of them follow the attorney general. Uh, some of them fall under the Department of Law Enforcement. Uh, usually they do that to save on resources because a standalone post, uh, sometimes it depends on if you have a, a number of personnel, you need an HR uh, division, you need a, an attorney, um, and some of those resources that if you fall under another entity, you can share those. The problem with falling under another entity, such as in Delaware, where you're under the state police, is the post needs to serve every city, county, and state law enforcement agency equally. And so you need to maintain autonomy and avoid any appearance that your actions are dominated by any particular agency such as the state police that they're under. It, it's very hard. I can tell you that when I was a post director, I was a post director for 10 years in Idaho. I was with them for 27 years. I rose up to the ranks, but um, for a period of time, we were under the Idaho State Police and I was a major with the Idaho State Police, but there were conflicts. Uh, there was a time when the uh, state police colonel wanted to hire an individual that didn't meet our fitness standards and he took me to task uh, because um, I, I kind of worked under him and I kind of didn't work under him. And, and there were conflicts. Uh, the previous director got in a conflict when, when the uh, state police wanted to take over um, some of the fitness equipment that the post had purchased and claim it as their own and set rules and regulations on it. Just those little things. Um, I think the conflicts could be bigger when uh, let's say if, if you're under a state police agency and the state police agency uh, is doing a decertification, do they, do they investigate their own people? Um, the post should be doing that uh, independently um, just to, to avoid that appearance that uh, those actions might, might be influenced by that. So uh, on, in, if you look at our model standards, we highly recommend that a post be independent and, and I know that's problematic in a lot of areas because it, it takes more resources, but that's the, probably the best way that they should be organized. Well, Mike, um, I, I also noticed that when we look at some of the other posts and the other councils and commissions throughout the country, often, many times you'll see that the Department of Corrections is also, um, had the, the post has oversight. I know that, well, unfortunately he's not here, but Al from Maryland, uh, they, they do that. Is that is that is that common? I know that you in Idaho had that as well. We did. Uh, not when I first started. When I first started, um, we, we only trained every law enforcement officer that had powers of arrest, which included um, the fish and game brand inspectors and, and things like that. But um, they built us a brand new facility is, is what happened. And then corrections later 
went to the governor and, and the budget committee and asked for funds so that they could have a, a nice training facility. And the governor said, well, uh, why don't you just fall on the post and, and we can combine this training facility and train both peace officers and corrections. Um, and, and that's kind of how it happened. I can tell you that about half of the, of the states train and certify corrections personnel and about half the states don't. Uh, but it all has to be worked out uh, legislatively uh, right. through the governor's office and, and through the Department of Corrections. Uh, some states uh, also train uh, dispatchers and certify them. Um, Oregon, for instance, does corrections, dispatch. They even do firefighters and private security. So it's kind of all over the board, depending on what state you look at, but about half of them do corrections. Okay. All right. Um, I also wanted to take, uh, if you could, for just a second and talk a little bit about we also, I also noticed when we're looking around the country and even abroad, you look at some of the training models that are out there around academies and law enforcement uh, training. Um, actually, in New Zealand, it's called police college, you know, for those folks to go there. What about what about these that are partnerships? And you had done this in your past as well with Boise State University and partnering with uh, um, uh, higher ed groups and in, in doing academies. Can you talk a little bit about that and where you're seeing that going? Well, um, the community colleges, we had three community colleges that ran law enforcement programs for young men and women who were not yet hired. Uh, to come through the Post Academy in Idaho, you had to be hired by an agency and the agency would send you through the academy. Uh, and so these young men and women that wanted a career, had not yet been hired, uh, would go through those programs. Um, they're hard to regulate um, we, we fought with the college all the time because we had certain hiring standards. They had to meet vision, hearing, um, criminal uh, record things. Um, you know, we looked at, at uh, traffic tickets, misdemeanors, things like that, drug use. Uh, we had those standards. The college didn't want to adhere to those. They want people in the seats. They want the money coming in. And so there was kind of a conflict there. So finally, what they did is they opened up their law enforcement program, the first half of it, to take those classes that um, aren't sensitive to law enforcement, things like um, uh, criminal law, um, search and seizure, those types of things, uh, anyone could take it. And then when they went into the second section, they had to meet the standards of uh, our post hiring standards so that it, once, once they were trained in those areas, uh, they could be hired by a law enforcement agency. Um, my relationship with Boise State University, um, which was uh, uh, their um, bachelor's degree program, um, what, what I talked with the um, chair of the criminal justice division was that these students that are going through criminal justice education could take and go through the, the police academy um, on their own, pay for it, be eligible for student loans, and that would count towards their bachelor's degree so that when they finished the police academy and finished the program, they graduated not only um, with the, the basic training and could be hired, but also with a four-year degree in criminal justice, which was a real benefit for many of the agencies. Um, as you mentioned in your standards, um, you set minimum standards, but agencies can, can develop higher standards. In Idaho, our minimum standard for education was just a high school diploma or GED. But, but some of the bigger agencies like the Boise Police Department, the Idaho State Police and so forth uh, required um, at least a two-year degree, some of them even a four-year degree. And so those people, uh, it gave them a real foot in the door uh, not only to be hired with a four-year degree, but then the agency would not have to send them through post because they've already got the post behind them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Zach, I saw you nodding about that on the, some of the education requirements. From yours, I think you touched on it before. Statutorily, you saw, did you see uh, associates or bachelor's degree, many states having that requirement statutorily? It's only California that we know of that has that requirement to have at least a two-year community college associate's degree. Um, all other states set the minimum standard at either a high school diploma or a GED. 
Okay. All right. And then past that, the agencies, of course, have their own standards, but they can't go below those specific standards. Right. So um, I was coming back over to you, Mike. Uh, I know that in, in Maryland, for example, and some mid, several other states, there are partnerships with or academies are run at community colleges where um, I know in Maryland, and again, I wish Al was here. I wish Al was feeling better, so Al could be here. So, but uh, uh, he, they have the Eastern Shore Criminal Justice Academy with associated with the Warwick Community College. Um, it's run, you know, the post has oversight. It's at that facility and those students get credits through the community college and working towards their associate's degree. Um, I know California, they have a number of those kinds of academies uh, at community colleges throughout. Um, that's a little bit different than where you're talking about a person goes in unaffiliated uh, or, you know, just goes in and gets their certifications. That almost sounds like, I think Pennsylvania and Sean, you might, Major Moriarty, you might be able to weigh back in on this one. They used to have the Act 120 um, candidates. I don't know if Pennsylvania is still doing that or not. It sounds similar to what Mike was just talking about. Yes, sir. So a couple of things. Yes, they do have Act 120, which is basically going to a college, but that's actually, they count that as a full academy for a lot of the townships in Pennsylvania. So they use that uh, they'll pay their own way and get a certification and then they'll use that as their police. Uh, they do run into some issues on reciprocity to other agencies because of the quality of the education or the quantity, depending upon what those uh, different parameters are there. But in Delaware too, uh, while we're on that topic, I just wanna talk about some great programs that we have uh, in that same venue. And that is, uh, we've had for years now a partnership with Delaware Tech, uh, Technical Community College, so known as our law enforcement option program. So that being said, basically uh, the students enroll in that course that they take their, their uh, the associate's degree program, their whole second year is completely devoted to this program as a special track. And at the end of that, they get the credits that they can apply directly uh, to our academy for an accelerated uh, program, graduate early and or duplicity of that training. So they get it in a college setting, but when they get into the academies, they're able to, to use that as well. So they may have had a course uh, at the college and then they get to the same course taught by a COPT instructor at the college. So they're an adjunct faculty member approved by the college, but then also uh, they are a member of the COPT. So the curriculum, just as um, you know, Major McCarr talked about, it's, it's exactly the same program, but it's innocuous. It's a non-dangerous class that we can talk that's not getting into something that's, uh, you know, interview interrogation techniques that's gonna jeopardize um, you know, those, those specific uh, methods or something like that. So the, those courses are completely outlined. We've done articulation agreement with them for, for years, uh, since I think 2010 is when we just about started that. That's been renewed every time. And then we also have a reverse articulation agreement with them. So what that means is those that um, enter our academy and don't have the degree, they're able to apply that back to Delaware Technical Community College in order to get that degree in the associates program. And then the other partnership we have is with Wilmington University, uh, specifically for our leadership program. So with that, uh, successfully completing of that program, it's a very arduous program. Uh, I'm very biased about that program. Uh, Colonel Zeppelin and I are very proud of that program, but for that, it's, uh, they're entitled to nine undergraduate credits for completing that three week program. So it's, you know, six uh, or three classes or three graduate credits or one master's level class for completing that. And again, that's a, a part of our process that they tie in exactly with our academy and our curriculum. So, so we are engaging in that. So I think that's important. And I, I think that's great to hear from our, our peers and our colleagues to, to talk about that sharing as well. Hey, Ruth, can I ask a question? Oh, excuse me, Ruth, were you gonna say something? I was, I was just gonna say another way to back that up is um, when the formation of the tech schools, when they went full time back in um, 90, I think it was about 92, um, they also developed programs at the high school level for those that wanted careers in criminal justice. And so they had articulation agreements at that time with Delta. So depending on what they had school, they might have certain credits that would then pass over. And that was before we had seeds. But so everything was sort of layered. Um, and one of the reasons in starting that in school was to students that other might not have considered a career in that and how to keep them on a path to something they saw as being successful in an alternative another way because many times you know as well as I do they can make mistakes as juveniles that at that time impacted the ability for what they wanted to do as adults so it was to try and get that mindset. Mm -hmm. 
representative is 100% correct. Uh, it's a great partnership. We can continue that. So, uh, in fact, I have uh, a meeting coming up with Sussex Tech and, and Georgetown again next week. Uh, and so does the chief has a couple of his officers as well. Or the week after, I forget, their schedules are a little crazy. But, uh, yes, to work on those exercises. But they have polytech I mean, up and down our state, our small state. But great, great partnerships to engage students, to engage those that are interested in pursuing a career in law enforcement. It's a great platform for dispatchers as well. It's a great platform for our cadets as entry level to get exposed. And uh, most of the instructors have some type of involvement in the criminal justice system, whether it be through the court system, through the police, um, retired officers, what have you, to engage them. There are no credit reciprocities, but the, the public service and the, work, the workload balances that they get is incredible, especially with the relationship you know, as they can carry on. So uh, thank you, Representative, you're 100% right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If, if I could, uh, I just wanted to ask a question while we we're kind of talking about that. I wanted to know from Zach, and from Michael about any data or information or trends that you're seeing as it relates to connections to um, recruitment specifically for persons of color and women and also any connections educationally as it relates to um, HBCUs. Zach or Michael? Yeah, uh -huh. I can, um, so we don't have any of those currently. We don't have any statutory data related to that specifically, um, and we're not seeing any legislation related to that specifically. Mm -hmm. Okay. We are seeing legislative conversation about it, but other, but we haven't seen sort of any introduced or enacted legislation about it specifically. Are you receiving the demographic data as it relates to the uh, gender and race of the, of the staff? We are, we are not. You're not receiving it. Okay. No. All right. Very good. Michael, anything you can offer? Uh, we're about the same. Um, we don't do a lot of research in that area. Um, we do a lot of exchanging of information and, and we'll have one of the post directors ask a question about uh, maybe uh, women, uh, are they having a, a large amount of women fail uh, the academy or fail the fitness requirements or um, things like that? Um, and, and what's the ratio of, uh, minority officers uh, per academy and so forth, but, but we don't keep statistics. Um, I do know that, that recruitment, a lot of agencies are uh, trying all types of, of new things to try to recruit women and people of color into the law enforcement um, um, occupations. Um, but we just don't have any statistical information I can give you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, uh, I will say the closest thing we have to what you're looking for, um, Chair Brewington Carr, is uh, Missouri uh, Bill, House Bill 46, which is about resi residency requirements. And that's about as close as we're seeing legislatively um, to any sort of recruitment stuff. Thank you. And, and so, um, Madam Chair, you must have been looking on my notes because that's exactly where I was going to go about recruitment and retention around this. Um, so these, and so when Sean, Major Moriarty was talking and Zach has been talking and Mike has been talking, we are, these things with our higher ed and our high schools are excellent recruitment tools, but we can do better. I mean, we can always do better. That's, that's just that we can always do better with that. So, but those are excellent, excellent tools. Mike, I want to circle back. I have two, two more questions for you, Mike, and, uh, I'll let you off the hot seat. <laughs> but uh, what, uh, I want to talk a little bit about problem-based learning and adult learning and what you're seeing around some evidence-based stuff some, some in, in curriculum development and training, some of that uh, research, if you could talk about that a bit. Yeah, um, one of the big problems with law enforcement training that we're seeing across the nation is training is done in blocks. Okay, they do an a, a eight-hour course on report writing and then they go to traffic stops and then they go to something else. Officers are not retaining very much information throughout the academy. Uh, we did a, a recent study just on uh, a hand-to-hand -hand things like defensive tactics, baton training and so forth. And officers uh, were trained, let's say in, in eight hours, 16 hours, 24 hours, whatever the case might be. And, and, and they all passed but then by the end of the academy, they lost most of those skills because they weren't repeated. They weren't em emphasized throughout the, the academy. So we're, we're pushing academies now when they do blocks of instruction, let's say they do an instruction on communication. Then 
teach that same, those same techniques in every other block of instruction, whether it be ethics, um, communication, um, community relations, whatever, carry it on into every block of instruction. Things like um, uh, baton training and defensive tactics, uh, handcuffing, uh, reinforce it throughout the academy. Do more problem-based training where officers are, they, they're given um, techniques in a classroom, but then they're, they're tested in a problem-based application and how well they can apply those techniques. And then that's a way where you can introduce the, the past training such as handcuffing, such as communication, such as ethics, um, all those different things uh, over and over. Um, and, and we just published a paper, we're really pushing for evidence or science-based training, uh, training that where research is done to find out what's effective, um, how the officers retain that information and what they can do to uh, uh, raise the bar on that uh, retention, such as uh, the defensive tactics or the hands-on training that I talked about. When, when they were doing it in blocks, they were losing most of that by the end of the academy and even further by the time they went back to their agency. But just by reintroducing one hour every week of the academy to reinforce those things, they were much, much more proficient when they graduated and went back to their academies. They weren't losing that information. Right. Uh, but but we didn't learn that until they did a little bit of research and found that out. So, so um, evidence-based, research-based training is very, very important. Problem-based training, um, many of the academies are now really focusing in this area um, and taking, uh, getting away from just the block training and reinforcing it throughout the uh, academy training that the officers go through. May I ask a question? Sure. You yeah. beat me to it, Ann. You beat me to it, but go ahead. <laughs> well, you can go ahead, Sharice, if you want. I, I, thank, I thank you so much. Um, I, I had a question as it relates to, um, I guess I was thinking about public sentiment or public um, surveys or anything like that, Zach, that you might um, have information on about the perceptions or um, just community involvement or the lack thereof or, or in general, or is NCLS um, keeping any data on that? Mike, do you have any data on that as well? Um, so we're not keeping any data on that specifically. We are tracking states that are introducing civilian review, review boards, either um, in the sort of investigation process and then they can make recommendations or in overseeing the investigations themselves. Um, and that's sort of the closest thing that we're seeing. It's uh, currently just a handful of states who are implementing that process. Um, and we've heard of one state whose name escapes me now, who is uh, looking at possibly um, introducing majority civilian membership on the post board themselves, um, as since the post board does that sort of review certifying investigation, sort of things like that. But that's the closest that we have. We don't have any um, direct public sentiment. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, Sharice, I think too, there are, and Dr. Farley, you may be getting ready to say this, there are a number of academic studies that have uh, recently, and I say recently, in the last three years, some really good, really good ones talking about that perception, actually talking about what, what citizens or what people want from their police agencies, some very, some very good, very good, I can, I'd be more than glad to forward what I have and send that to you or to anyone else. And Dr. Farley, I think you had a question as well. Um, thank you, Chief Hughes. I appreciate that very much. And um, my question has more to do with, um, you, you talked about the academy and the training and, and um, curriculum. In, in the curriculum, how much and hours are dedicated towards cultural competency, uh, towards working with um, special populations, with persons who... Uh, might be suffering from a um, behavioral health issue, addiction, and domestic. How much is spent time um, training in the curriculum on learning those skills in addition to the other, uh, if you would, you call them, I guess, warriors, you know, the baton yeah. and those types of things. Could you give me some sense of that? Well, Academies are doing more and more in these areas, but I can tell you it's not enough, um, especially 
in dealing with um, mental uh, issues and, and disabilities and things like that. That's why there's so much outcry right now of trying to get um, social workers uh, to ride with law enforcement to respond to those types of calls. You take a social worker or, or a person that, that is skilled in, in that area and they've had years of training. A police officer might get two hours, four hours, eight hours. Um, that's nothing um, uh, compared to uh, basically it's, it's just to know what resources are available. Um, and, and so that's, that's a real problem in law enforcement. And then what they're faced with all the time in, in a basic academy is everybody wants more, more classes introduced into the basic academy, but you only have so many hours that you're funded for. You only have so many hours that the chiefs and sheriffs in the state will stand to have their officers gone. So they want, they want their officers back as quickly as possible. So every time these things are introduced, the first thing the post directors say, well, what do I cut out in order to add these things? And, and so it's difficult. Uh, I can tell you that in those skills, probably not enough. And it varies all across the United States, every academy. You know, I like to say that we have 50 academies doing the same thing 50 different ways. Um, and and if, if you look at each one of their mandated hours, it'll be different. It'll be different hours for those topics that you, that you talked about. Thanks. Uh, my follow-up question too, if I may, or make a comment, you know, I know that when, and I'm a civilian, so I'm not familiar with this. So if I'm way off base, just, you know, throw it out, you know, but um, you, know, you look at police officer training and some of that training, then they go into specialized training. And just by the name, you know, names mean a lot. The words mean a lot. And when you just the connotation of police, it's law and order. It is that uh, you said earlier, the warrior versus guardian perspective and that and and it, I don't know that it's necessarily a dichotomy but if maybe there would be special training uh, developed or a, a venue of training for people to be peace officers people that would go out you know I went through the whole list of individuals uh, in Black Lives Matter who lost their lives at the hands of an interaction with the police officer. Uh, law enforcement. In many of those cases, there were uh, mental health issues or there was a family calling for domestic di dispute and really looking for a restoration of peace and, and assistance versus uh, law and order. And, um, and I, I was just struck by that. Could you just give me some where you, where you your organization is and kind of reviewing that and looking at it and one of some of the where the direction that you you think um, states ought to be going? Well, you know, and, and I hear you, and um, we're really pushing agencies to, to train officers to that guardian mindset that I talked about, so that when they respond to a call, they, they have that guardian mindset, not that warrior mindset, so that they don't go in and get into an initial automatic conflict. They don't go in with such authority that they cause a disruption or cause a problem. You know, when I was a police officer, I, I spent 12 years on the, on the uh, street as a police officer, and I could go into a situation and depending on what sergeant came in to back me up, I, I could tell you if that situation would escalate or not, just based on that individual and how he approached the situation, his demeanor, his attitude, and things like that. So we're, we're trying to teach the police officers the empathy. Um, when we taught uh, uh, victim services types of training, such as burglaries or rapes or things like that, um, when I was an academy director, what I started doing was bringing in victims um, to talk to the police officers because they never saw that. A police officer responded to a burglary where someone's home, they've been violated and, and things have taken um, and the officer takes an initial report and leaves and they never hear anything. They don't know what's going on, uh, especially in a rape with, with a woman who might've been raped. 
and, and they, they go through all that trauma, but they never hear back. Um, and, and when they, we brought in the victims and the officer could see that side of it and how it affected people and, and how they needed that um, affirmation um, and that information on what's being done, um, and the, the follow-up, all those types of things, the officers became much more sympathetic um, and because they understood the victim side of it. And so I see training going more and more in that direction in the community relations to try to um, go out in the community and find out what the community thinks. Uh, you know, in, in community policing, it's kind of interesting when um, we were presented with a problem, um, the police officers would automatically come up with, well, here's the solution. But when they went into the community and gave them the same problem and asked them what the solution was, it was very different than what law enforcement thought. So we're, we're seeing training go more and more in that direction so that, so that they, they have that understanding and they're involving the community um, and, and they've got that, uh, that guardian mindset uh, where they're, where they're uh, uh, bonding with the community, they're guarding the constitution, they're guarding uh, the individuals and their rights and, and uh, those types of things. So it, it's a process, it's a long process. Um, law enforcement training uh, goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and, and there's all uh, types of feeling about um, uh, academies, should they be militaristic? Should they be uh, college-based? Should they be somewhere in between? All those things are changing, but it, it takes a lot of time. Um, and I can tell you that right now with what's going on in the public outcry, um, law enforcement is paying attention. Um, and I, I see a lot of post directors uh, right now reorganize their training, taking a hard look at what they're training officers and uh, uh, doing more task analysis, more evidence-based to see what's working, what's not working and so forth. It, thank, it, you. thank you for that. If, if I could, um, and this has been a, it's a rich conversation, we're continuing, and, and I'm not trying to hijack it here, uh, Chief Hughes, but it's just so thought-provoking uh, what these gentlemen are, are sharing, um, and, and thank you for, for allowing that. Um, I wanted to know uh, a bit about, and we understand that this is a relationship, it's the community and it's the public, um, and it's the police, and it's a lot of stakeholders in that regard. I wanted to know if you're collecting any data or you're seeing any training trends as it relates to uh, working with officers, I call them walking wounded, persons who are exposed repeatedly to trauma or traumatic situations, things of that nature. And you know what does that look like? And the follow-up to that, maybe separate, maybe connected, is I wanted to know if there's any data, database information as it relates to litigation, successful litigation, and uh, what the, um, not return on investment or the return on investment when you don't do good training. Maybe that's you, Zach and Michael, but if you both could kind of speak to that, it would be great. Um, so I can speak at least to the officer wellness piece. Um, we're seeing incre significantly increased legislative interest on this. However, statutorily, that isn't really there. Um, and so that doesn't necessarily mean that the post boards are not making those, uh, those decisions or that individual agencies aren't making those decisions, but at the state level, um, they're, they're just not setting those statutes for requirements of care for the police officers and counting these kinds of traumas regularly. Um, we are seeing, however, increased interest. There was a couple of bills in uh, 2020 that were related specifically to officer wellness. Um, not just physical wellness, but emotional and mental wellness as well. Um, and in the emerging legislation that we're seeing right now, there's that's an increasing trend is sort of how do we also take care of our officers in the work that we do. Um, then sort of past that, we don't really know of any lawsuits currently that are um, successful. We're also not tracking that issue specifically. Um, we're more tracking the sort of statutory side, the legislative interest side. Um, in general. I will also say that um, statutory training requirements are, are about as all over the place as individual post board training requirements. Um, so in special populations um, are probably the most robust in terms of how many states have those statutory requirements. Um, and those are victims of domestic abuse, traffic individuals, those sorts of things. But then once you drill down into 
um, cultural racial but racial bias training or stuff like that you maybe get half the half the country maybe a little bit less maybe a little bit more um thank you mike did you did you have anything to offer mike no um and you know what zach said we we don't have statistics in that area and uh, i know the posts when they um are developing their budgets and and uh, the the minimum hours of of training and so forth that they're looking at return on investment um, and, and they factor in the agency's cost to send the officer and, and backfill the position. Uh, the only other area that we've got into that significantly is uh, we do a data driven approaches of traffic yes. safety uh, training all over the nation and we do a cost analysis training so they can, they can uh, kind of see the return on the investment for deploying officers based on um, analytics, uh, where the crime is occurring, where the traffic uh, accidents are occurring and things like that. Um, on officer safety and wellness, uh, we're right now, IATLAS is developing a national program uh, for officer safety and wellness. Uh, we're uh, in the process of doing a job task analysis with the agencies to find out uh, what, what they're seeing and what their needs are. And then we're also uh, bringing in subject matter experts from around the United States to help develop that training. Um, and then we'll roll that out uh, nationwide. We've identified about nine um, needed training from de-escalation to um, officer safety and wellness, um, those types of things that we'll be developing national curriculum for, for agencies to utilize. Again, we can't force the agencies to utilize that, but we offer it uh, and we'll be, off, be able to offer it at no cost to agencies nationwide. Thank you. Uh, uh, Chair Brewington Carr, I also want to add um, that we are seeing interest in sort of qualified immunity, specifically looking at that as sort of the, the civil way of exploring that. Currently only two states, Colorado and Connecticut, have passed any uh, legislation related to qualified immunity. And that's Colorado 2020 Bill SB 217 and Connecticut 2020 House Bill 6004. Um, and those are their two qualified immunity bills. Um, I will also say my other specialty on the employment side is uh, occupational regulation writ large. Um, so I study how occupations are regulated generally. Um, and regular review of requirements and the effectiveness of those requirements is a, is a deeply emerging practice. And it's either through sunrise or sunset reviews. The bulk of these are forced through sunset reviews, the regular reoccurring, what are your standards? What's your budget? How are you doing this? How has it changed? Why has it changed? Like justify all of these things to the legislature. Um, and then the legislature then can make decisions based on sort of what that report brings forward. Um, how those individual reports happen is um, you know, sort of the reoccurring theme. If you have a state, you have a way that it happens. Um, but that's sort of an increasing trend that we're seeing for occupations that are regulated by the state writ large is this continuing review of requirements for individuals and of the authority of the regulatory agency. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the issues with having suits against the post boards themselves is that they are technically... Um, the government, they're technically authorized by the legislature to do the work of the legislature through the executive branch. Um, and so there's some weird and in interesting sort of legal stuff that gets involved there. There have been some successful cases like the NC Dental case, which was an antitrust case. Um, but in general, when we're from the legislative side, if we're looking at lawsuits, we're looking at um, qualified immun immunity for the specific officer, not necessarily lawsuits against the post board writ large. Thank you very much, both of you. Yeah, uh, uh, Major Moriarty. So, and uh, in terms that I think that we're all on this, the great topic of wellness. Certainly, uh, I know that uh, Sharice is leading the charge on this for officer wellness around. But I mean, one of the data sets is certainly going to be the high incidence of suicide rates for the profession. Unfortunately, that's daunted us since the beginning. Uh, and we also are starting to look. You talk about evidence-based policing that uh, Major Picard talked about. It's certainly that that's definitely part of it too. We're not looking at just the critical incident stress, but we're looking at the cumulative stress over time and how that uh, plays a huge role on, on our officers' health. But getting also getting back to, uh, you know, I know that uh, Dr. Farley asked about hours. So just to kind of give you an example too of hours for curriculum. In COPT, we talked about that being the base the baseline of 584 hours. Well, at our academy, we provide over 896 hours. 
So we're providing exponentially more training and it's, uh, you know, to the director's points too earlier, uh, absolutely problem-based learning approach. We know that the pedagogy and how we're, how we're learning through this and those adult learning modalities is taking all of those courses. We can't just simply teach one block and have that retention that stays there. We are absolutely following uh, what I, I wholly support what, what Mike talked about is that we start off with these foundational building blocks, which then lead to each thing along the whole way so that every single course matches up with the prior courses so that we have this more longitudinal uh, area of studies that builds upon each other, including the role play, which Chief Hughes talked about, these the scenario-based instruction, that problem-based that get uh, increasingly difficult as they go out and they're working their way through the problem to not only learn, but to work collaboratively with others to recognize those signs and symptoms that are affecting, whether that be an element of mental health crisis. Uh, so, and also kind of going down that path, I mean, we completely changed our curriculum in 2015 to follow not only that suit, but to, to line up the curriculum, but also to increase our mental health awareness classes. So community engagement, for example, we bring in folks who are suffering from mental health uh, disabilities. We, they talked about crises that they went through, maybe just on a short term or long term systemic issues that they face. We bring in folks that are, you know, that suffer from autism. We bring in folks that are suffering from schizophrenia. So we have that active engagement with real people to see where we need to change, um, you know, our, our training to focus on that and mental health experts. You know, even on that too, we do debriefs on, on how that training, what did you learn from that scenario? What did you learn from that training block? How does it relate to like the victimology that was just talked about, about victims coming in? We work at our victim center on that. And then we carry on beyond our training academy to focus on the field training. How do you take something from the academic setting and matriculate that into the real life practice of being on the street with those, those role players that are, um, you know, are already emaciated into the process? So Certainly we do that. And then kind of one last thing too to build upon in addition to external classes like crisis intervention training, which is across the country. Uh, so we provide that 40 hour training class with true professionals in the mental health world to train uh, a certain population, not every officer, but a large portion to understand when somebody is suffering those, those crises, to diagnose that, to start de-escalating and to look at responding, uh, response to resistance over a use of force. And some might say, well, that's semantics to play on words. It's really not. It's a whole mindset or ideology of how we're changing it, that we can de-escalate back off and to try to resolve this conflict the best we can with the minimal amount of any kind of hands-on um, involved. So, uh, you know, to that end, too, what was brought up, we've, uh, we've got a great partnership with our another with our uh, Delaware Substance Abuse and Mental Health. It's another under so Delaware Health and Social Services. So we actually partnered with them. Uh, so we have those at three of our troops statewide. That are, I know the chief has a great program also in Georgetown and in uh, some other areas, Newcastle County Police, um, you know, as uh, Representative Cook's old agency has. So we have great programs across the state that we are working with mental health professionals to deal with crisis. So, for example, we just had a, a barricade uh, last week uh, with a subject with a knife. And next thing you know, he's, he's threatening suicide and all kinds of different, and immediately we're calling those DSAM representatives, those counselors, those care managers to respond out to assist with us with negotiations. And that's exactly what happened in that case just last week. So we're seeing these community partnerships. We're realizing that we need to interact with the community. We realize that we need to have a better understanding, not just in a closed world, but more of an open systems idea. And we're also looking at how the different generations the millennials, the Z-lennials that are coming out and how they are thinking differently, how they're learning differently and how we're leveraging technology with that. So it is a very comprehensive process uh, that we are paying attention to too. We started in 2015, we completely revised our response to resistance policies, all the different force models from our, you know, the, the tools that are used, all of that to align to, to better serve the community. But as the chief mentioned a few minutes ago too, uh, we still have work to do. But we've also gone a long way, and I think it's important that this committee in particular understands that it's, you know, it's not 1980, it's not 1970, it's not 1994. We are here and we are growing, and this is a great way to, to continue to move forward. Thank you, um, Major, for that. I really appreciate you detailing uh, what Delaware is doing and, uh, and the partnerships that you're having and the uh, types of curriculum that you're doing. I really appreciate the work you're doing it and the spirit in which you're doing it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Farley. So in the interest of, interest of time, and I don't know if we have any public comment, I do, I do have a, one more question for Mike uh, here in just a second, but just to, just to kind of clarify, um, Major Moriarty is talking about what's going on at the State Police Academy, doing a very, very nice job. 
We have some other academies in the state that are doing a very nice job. But what we want to really focus on are those statewide standards. Most of our academies are offering more than the minimum 584 hours. And Dr. Farley, you had asked how many hours are required for certain things. And they, they're minuscule. They're not that much. But as Major Mortier already talked about, there's a lot more going on. But from a state, should we be at a, so the question is, is, should we rely on minimum standards only? And I'll leave it at that. That's, that's for the greater debate. On the evidence-based uh, piece and the science-based approach that Mike talked about earlier, I just want to circle back to that. And to, for you, Dr. Farley, uh, the nice thing in that paper, that research paper that Mike uh, referenced was about using de-escalation as an example of how it goes through everything that you do, through any type of thing that you may need to use some kind of uh, a response to resistance, um, de-escalating, de-escalating, de-escalating. So that is not just taught in a 16 hour block, it's taught throughout. So that's, that research is very good and we need to make sure that all of our folks are, are using that. Mike, I wanna circle back to you and, and I promise this is my last question for you, Mike, and, I, and I'm gonna let you go. Job task analysis. Uh, I heard that mentioned before and I looked at uh, some things on the, on the site there. So job task analysis, post or councils or peace officer standards and training commissions, um, what's your what's the recommendation for doing job task analysis and developing curriculum around that job task analysis has been um, highly recommended for years that's the only real legal way to develop training it's defensible um, you can show that that the officers number one are doing it uh, how often they're doing it and what the ramifications are for not doing it um, so a job task analysis is critical. I, I, uh, I'd have to look in our recommendations, but I've heard in the past that they recommend that a, a job task analysis be done every maybe five years, eight years. A lot of uh, posts aren't doing them, but maybe every 20 years or so, only because of the cost. Um, and it is expensive unless you uh, use some in-house uh, people to do it, a uh, university or something like that. But many times you have to be careful because uh, you don't get the results that you want. But uh, job task analysis, I think, is critical uh, anytime you develop training uh, to find out what the officers are actually doing. We're, we've done that at, at post developing basic training for years and years. But we're now at IATLAS doing that when we're developing a small box of training, uh, such as officer safety and wellness or we're doing a, a curriculum right now on peer intervention uh, to get uh, bystanders, uh, officers that are bystanders involved in stopping something that they know is wrong um, so that uh, those, those bad situations don't happen. Uh, but we're, we're doing job task analysis even for those training situations because so many times um, someone has set set up there and develop training and, and shut it down to the officers, but they never ask the officers what they're doing and what they need out there. Um, so we're looking at all of that um, to develop uh, valid defensible training. Thank, thank you, Mike. Um, I, I had a question. And yes. when, you, when you're talking about the job task analysis um, and, and in relation to the training you're doing, we generally know that what we're doing today is after a trial and error or something that happens. Um, so I wanted to back that up and say that I think part of the process is not just the training, but it's the looking at the qualifications and the recruitment before you get to that training aspect. That's like on down the line. And so I wanted to know if there was any type of correlation or work that had been done between when before um, a recruit is hired and there's usually you know, a written test, there's usually a psychological test and then a physical test and so forth. If there's ever any reflection back on that psychology, that psych analysis with the behavior, if there's ever any correlation um, between the two when you're having some discipline problems or going to decertify somebody, if there's a pattern that seems to follow a practice. I guess that's what I'm asking. So that you can back up and say, these certain personality traits or these things have shown to be problematic 
in having a peace officer, that they're more prone to another um, type of action. I mean, has, has that occurred? Yes. Yes, Representative King, uh, absolutely. Um, the problem, I think, is it's in our recommendations uh, for peace officer selection, because if, if you do a, a real good analysis, psychological evaluation, you can, you can identify those traits before they become problems. But the, the, where the problem comes in is there's states out there that do not require any psychological evaluation. Agencies will do it, but the, the minimum standards of the state don't require it. Uh, some states don't even require polygraphs. Uh, it's just, it, it's just again, it's all over the board. Um, and, and I know that uh, there's a lot of talk right now for national standards. There needs to be national standards so that all these states are doing this, the same thing. But uh, that's problematic because you've got, in, in our democracy, the states are independent entities and set their own legislation rules. Um, but, but we're pushing for, and, and I don't like the use of term national standards. I, use, I like to use the term best practices, but we're pushing to take, let's say job task analysis that have done it, been done in every state, studying those and finding the commonalities. What, what are the common things that a peace officer does and develop a best practice training curriculum to save the state's money in, in their job task analysis so they don't have to reinvent um, those common things that every state has in common and they just have to look at what's specific to their state in training. Um, but as far as recruitment um, and psychological evaluations, things like that, um, th that's problematic because it's, it's just not mandated in many, many of the states. Uh, but we have definitely looked at that and we have seen a correlation. Um, I saw it in, in our own state where we could identify um, problematic behavior by going back and looking at the psychological evaluation that was done and the agency uh, decided not to follow it. So is there any place that a recruitment person could go and look at the, the indicators these you know, these, um, you know, these answers on these tests place them in a, a risk um, kind of category for hire, not necessarily saying no, but is there any, because I, I've done scores in human resources, even for whether it be a financial institution, there's certain questionnaires and psychological tests that you can give them, you know, pick out so many words based on a prompt or whatever that sort of indicate this person would not be suitable for this type of work or what have you. And they're pretty darn accurate. If you ever take a risk on somebody thinking that uh, this is what we can do, and then you find out ah, that test was pretty darn accurate. So just wondering if there's anything where those um, that might have limited resources because in a perfect world, many of our departments, not the state police, but many of our smaller departments are going to have problems with resources and their own um, capacity um, to understand what they may need to do. I'm putting that gently. <laughs> let me jump in, Mike. Yeah. Mike, Mike let, me, let me jump in on that. We, it is required in Delaware to do a psychological evaluation. So I just wanted to put that out there. So we, we have to do that. Um, sure. And uh, now that's not to say that perhaps we need to take a look at that evaluation, what that's all about. That, I'm not right. saying that there is a requirement through the Council on Police Training that we do that. So go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I think, um, Representative King, the, the agencies need to look at the post that's setting the standards. And then we're IATALYST, we're, help, we're here to help the post so that if the post don't, doesn't have those answers, we can reach out to the large agencies that have done those types of studies that have psychologists on their staff. Um, and we have a number of, of large agencies that have that and have done a lot of studies. We can, we can put them in touch and get that information. That's kind of what we do at IATLAS in helping the various posts. So um, probably uh, other than that, I don't know of another um, specific resource they could go to, but I know we could pull it together if one of the post assets. I would be that real is, curious to see if any of those tests have been the, the current, if they, you know, how they're in 
including some things that might suggest implicit bias or just some other stuff, because I imagine that some of these tests or whatever that are being used have been around there a while, and maybe they're not very reflective of, you know, our current dynamics or things that have been changing in the, within the last, you know, um, four years or, mm -hmm. or less. And so just because sometimes you get so used to using an instrument and maybe that instrument isn't where it needs to be today. Am yeah. I, yeah, that yeah. I agree that that's probably something we should. I don't know that answer, so we'd have to take a look at that. Yeah. But I think Zach, had a quick, I think Zach, I had a quick question. Right. Oh, Chief, I had a quick question. For you. Sure. And especially as it relates to these, uh, the test, the MMPI. This was one of my my questions coming in uh, on on this committee as well, uh, especially local, state, and I was federal. So in federal, we would take the MMPI. It was mandatory to, to get in. Um, but we would get randomly tested for drug tests. We would get randomly uh, a polygraph. My question is, I think that there should be more than just an interest, uh, entrance MMPI because man, you, we go through shootings, we go through stresses. And I, I just don't see why And my, my suggestion was, my recommendation was early on that that needs to be done more. I mean, we do everything else. We need to, we need to really look at the mental health of an officer, agent, or, or whatever during the course of his career or her career. Right, that, that is an excellent suggestion as far as, and that goes right back to, I think it was Dr. Farley that talked about, uh, and, and Teresa talked about uh, officer wellness. That is a part of that that certainly needs to, be, needs to be discussed. But before I move on, or before anybody else, I want Zach to jump in because he, he had to, something to, to respond to. I, I, I will also say in response to Representative King, your question that, Statutorily, there are only about eight states that require any sort of uh, mental examination as a requirement of certification, um, only about eight. Um, and the bulk of those say that it's just a requirement um, and that it has to be done by an approved physician. The only state that we know of that has robust psychological examinations as a condition of certification is Texas. Um, and so that would be the one that I would suggest you look at. Uh, we have there language in our statutory database. Um, and that's not that's before the police officer can even be considered for hiring. That's for them to get their certification to be considered for employment. Um, and there are only maybe eight to 10 states who have any sort of statutory language whatsoever. To that. Um, and then on top of that, there are no states that have, um, at least in the statutes that I found, requirements for continued psychological and physical examination after you've been certified. So one of the things that happens with Licensing is that you have to renew your license and continually prove to the state that you are qualified to do the work that you're um, legally allowed to do with your license. There are no continued requirements whatsoever for physical or um, mental examination to like meet certain standards um, to get a renewed certification. If the certification even has a renewal process, which is also as another cut off right. So uh, if I can add just a couple things on this. So uh, in Delaware, as the chief mentioned, uh, I'll kind of read that. I know that um, now did an awesome job of going over things, but it says right in there that the applicant shall take and successfully complete a validated psychiatric psychological test to show his or her competency to perform law enforcement duties. The applicant shall also be required to be examined in person and receive endorsement by a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist to determine that his or her mental and emotional stability is suitable to perform law enforcement duties which includes, uh, for example, race relations, use of force and authority, flexibility and maturity, mental exam rejections such as psychoneurotic reaction resulting in hospitalization, prolonged care by physician, or loss of time for repeated periods as grounds for uh, rejection. So that is a requirement in Delaware for all uh, officers coming in to the point about the overall wellness too. I can just speak for, for state police in Delaware is that you know we have our critical incident stress management teams. That is legislated, so going back to, um, to Mr. Herman's uh, talk about the, I'm very impressed by that research, by the way, Zach, awesome job. But, but with that, in terms of, you know, we have, that's legislated, that we have our peers that are able to go in and speak to our officers and have immunity to be able to diagnose in a critical event and speak to them as a peer that's, you know, what is the event that you just suffered from? And they have that to be able to relate and then get them additional resources, whether it be employee assistance program or what have you. But every critical incident that our troopers are involved in, they're required to go and get at least an initial consultation and review with a licensed psychiatrist, psychologist. Uh, and that may lead to a fitness for duty evaluation. So depending upon the circumstances, depending on what those answers are. 
I don't know if the, you know, they're actually getting to the specifics of an MMPI and so forth, but it is clearly enunciated what the, you know, the psychiatrist and the psychologist and the ongoing, not just initial, but ongoing, but I agree, very, very important. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. So, and again, that goes to, that's on the state police. So that's probably in a regulation um, of COPT, Sean, that's why you didn't see it, Zach, in the statute. I think it's in the, in the 800 section of the regulations. Um, but again, and if it's on state police, so we're specifically not looking at state police because they right. often have their own section of code. Um, yeah, and that's, and that's not, it's actually, it is the code, but it's the code for the whole state of Delaware. Okay. All right. All right. So with that said, and being mindful of our time, because I did not think we'd be going this long, but we had some good discussion tonight, I think. So, so um, before I turn it over to any public comment, any one last go around for questions from, from the, the group here. No, I, don't I just have... want to thank you every I want to thank the panelists. I appreciate the expert testimony. I want to thank the major and you chief as well for your um, presentation and your questioning it was very good discussion. Thank you. I was going to say can the I same. Just, can I just oh. jump in for a second? I'm sorry, Sharice. Um, one of the things that we didn't discuss and I, I know we don't have a lot of time was uh, community involvement in um, training oh. <clears throat> and um, I know that at least for our current COPT, there are um, some, there are some community members, um, and even at, at broadly for commissions, there are at most twenty members. Um, so either Zach or Mike, could you kind of talk about um, community involvement, either in in a post or even an advisory committee board that? Um, works in tandem with these posts? You know, um, a lot of the, the post commissions are uh, putting more civilians on their commission. And I think you talked about that earlier. The other thing that, that I am seeing a lot of academies across the nation do that really helps is they're running citizen police academies that might be a week long. And those are extremely beneficial to the citizens because they, they start really understanding uh, how the police are trained and, and what they do and the decisions they have to make and, and the stress they're under when they have to make those split second decisions. Uh, and so they're getting more and more of the community involved that, that way. Uh, usually those citizen police academies are only um, a week long, maybe sometimes two weeks long, but they can run multiple ones if they have the staff and the time. And it, it, it really builds a tremendous community uh, bonding with the law enforcement. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Zach, did you have anything to weigh in on that one? Um, I would just say that at least from the legislative side, we're only really seeing the creation of civilian review advisory commissions. So they're usually separate from the police board um, and they don't have um, power to sort of make decisions on discipline. They have power to review and advise. Um, and so we're not seeing any ones that specifically have that disciplinary power that the post board has. Um, and Mike, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know of any post board that has majority civilian membership in the, on no. the board. No, not the majority. Uh, most of them um, is chiefs and sheriffs and, and uh, state police and corrections and things like that. But uh, they have anywhere from one to three, maybe six is the most that I've seen, but not the majority, no. And I would say that's, pretty much exactly in line with how all other sort of professional regulation boards that are, are state mandated or are run. I don't know of any EMT boards or anything like that that have majority civilian as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for sharing that. I just wanted to say, RL, this has been amazing. And I'd like to think, uh, Zach and Michael, we're just going to adopt you all in Delaware here. <laughs> and um, you know, get in, in, in right major, and we're going to get back to you as it relates to some resource. You've got some data and information. I think that's going to be very beneficial as we continue to consider our work and what we're doing. This was very, very timely in terms of the scope of the work that we're trying to do. Thank you all. Thank you, Natalie, for you know uh, laying out the 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 statute for us, so we really know where we are and what we're doing and what have you. That's very important. Um, thank the public and what have you for participating. And I, I'm not sure, RL, let's, let's find out uh, and Mark if we have any persons from the public that uh, would like to give public testimony. Thank you so much. Okay, Mark, do we have anyone that uh, for public comment? 
Uh, at this time, no one has their hands raised. Um, if anybody uh, who is a member of the public would like uh, to speak, uh, you will have uh, two minutes in the order in which you raise your hand. I have one. Um, Aaron Goldner, uh, you can unmute yourself and you have two minutes. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Aaron Goldner. <clears throat> I've been listening for a while, for years, I think about this. Um, and I used to be like really interested in understanding policies and different municipality policies and, you know, how everybody practices policing. I'm a person in recovery. Uh, I went to Dell Tech criminal justice and I did actually think about being a police officer. I have a record and um, I was a little older and a female. Not that any of that, that should change um, or affect if I want to be a police officer, but it, it kind of did change my mind. What, what would a 28 year old woman be doing becoming a police officer, but, but they do. And so that that's not an excuse. Um, I think the civil servant or um, citizen police training, as soon as you guys start talking about that, I think that is helpful, especially people that are in the community doing work trying to help people find recovery or find whatever pathway they need to find um, a choices. The antitrust law was mentioned in, and it is about not monopolizing choices. So having um, civil training, I think would be um, really awesome and inclusive. And then uh, maybe people uh, could break down some barriers and bring in some appreciation of culture and, um, you know, all unicorns and rainbows, but seriously, um, maybe it could break down some of these barriers we have between police and community because it's getting really old and um, loving police officers and loving community members that may not be making all the great choices, loving all these people and seeing all this uh, turmoil and then not being able to do anything. But if we had more, maybe some civil like you're saying citizen trainings or whatever they are, where you get some police officers who are maybe getting ready to retire, whatever, or are retired or whatever, or are current participating in these trainings. Um, I know in Wilmington, they, there's a lot of awesome community policing. It's great. And more people maybe could be understanding the, the training aspects, the um, protocol aspects, the, um, Sometimes some of us react because that's just the way we are. But if we had maybe a little training, maybe we would react better or be more helpful in certain situations, especially when there's a shooting and everybody's screaming and going nuts and the police officers have to deal with those situations. But maybe some of those community members were trained on why the police officer can't react the same way they are. They have to keep calm. They have to analyze the situation or whatever just happened. And, um, and then everybody's going nuts, you know, hundred people just show up. I'm a little bit rambling now, but I think some community members might find it helpful to understand why police officers are having certain protocol actions. I can't think of the word I'm trying to use, but strategic actions. And they would be like, oh, I know why they're doing that. Let me be more helpful and not run all over the place screaming. <laughs> Maybe I stay calm too and we'll have a, a debrief be included in a debrief in three days or a week or I don't know, five days. And we know we're gonna be able to discuss this, but right now acting the way we are might not be helping the situation. And it, and it informs people and gives people knowledge in some form of education. And education is, is we want to be able to provide, I want to be able to provide people education and, and make them more intelligent, not less intelligent and uh, work together. But that's just my two cents. I, I, you know, all this stuff that's going on starts to wear on your soul and then you become really jaded and then you just don't care. And I don't ever want to be that person. And I, and I love our law enforcement and I appreciate them. And I know our community members do too. And I think educational opportunities to become a better citizen is, is provides dignity and respect for, you know, but thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, next up is Cindy Romer. Um, if uh, any other members of the public would like to speak, um, please uh, raise your hand. Uh, Sydney, you are able to unmute. Okay, hi, thank you all for your time. Um, I just wanted to make a comment. I know that the primary use of the decertification index is, you know, according to the site, preventing unqualified police officers from holding critical positions of public trust. And I know this isn't the accountability task force and that there's state laws, but I just wanted to make a comment that there are other reasons why the public would want to know about an officer's decertification. So, you know, it's not just because you got pulled over for a ticket and, and want to know what's going on. Um, personally, I would want to know if someone who has been officially decertified was running for my local school board or um, was working on any board that impacts disadvantaged communities. So I just wanted to clarify that a little bit that um, there are other reasons why, you know, people would want to know those things. So thank you. I appreciate your time and, and knowledge on these topics. Thank you. Thank you. Todd Mumford, two minutes. Good evening, folks. Um, I'm Todd Mumford. I'm a probation and parole officer here in Delaware. And uh, I just want to say, I think these are some great discussions that you're having. Um, I was interested to hear that a lot of uh, corrections agencies across the country are part of some sort of standardized training program that's governed by a post uh, type board. I know in Delaware, we don't do that. Um, and in, inside a facility, I know it's different than the type of training that you need on the street. But I find as a probation officer, uh, there is a training gap uh, from what we get as probation and parole officers and what police officers get. Despite the fact that, you know, we're in the same communities, um, I got a, quite a lot of guys that are embedded in task forces with state, county, and local police, as well as federal agencies. So I think these are important discussions to be having uh, and look forward to seeing what kind of uh, solutions you guys come up with. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Todd. Uh, there is no more uh, members of the public who have raised their hand. All right. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm going to thank our Zach and Mike for your participation. I really appreciate it. And, and unfortunately, I have your contact information now. So I'm going to be reaching out to both of you uh, quite a bit. Uh, now that I've found you, I'm not going to let you go. So thank you very much. Natalie, thank you for the overview of COPT. Major Moriarty, thank you very much for your insight. You want to get the rep representative there? Might want to say a word. Cook, you have the last word. No, I don't want to have the last word. Thank you, Representative Ruth Briggs King for being here mm -hmm. board the whole time. Thank you to Major Moriarty, to Mr. Beacon, Mr. Beacar, and also Zach. Great job. I hope we get this data that we need. Uh, I'm holding you to it. I'm holding you to it. We need that data and to have it and share it. And like you're saying, transparency with our community, with our constituents, mm -hmm. very important. And thank you RL for what you do. And Dr. Ann Farley, what can I say? <laughs> um, and also- You yeah, better not say anything about me. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. And you can't talk right about here. my committee yeah. member representative. You can't do that. <laughs> Well, Sharice, you know, you're the sub-chair. You, you're the chair, Madam Chair. But thank you for, uh, this, this is very, 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 very good discussion. You know, and I'm going to steal uh, Sharice Bordenton's, the chair's words. We, we're peeling the onion. <laughs> we're peeling the onion. And that's what we need to do and, and, and work together. You know, compromise and work together. And, and I thank all of you for what you're doing. And I'm glad I, I just I have to say um, I noticed that we also in terms of our guests that we had an opportunity to have Nathaniel McQueen, who is the um, a commander of the Delaware State Police that's been on with us. We also had members of uh, other members of the task force and subcommittee. So thank them for listening in. Also, and we look forward to to working with all of them. And thank you to the public so much. Your voice matters. And we're glad that you were able to to tell us what you were thinking. And we want you to continue to do so. Yeah, Sharice, Sharice, I just wanted to say thank you, Zach, and thank you, Mike. Uh, great information. Chief Hughes, awesome job tonight. Um, Major, great job, and everybody else who participated, excellent job. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. And with that, we're at 9.01 p.m. We thought we weren't sure we were going to have uh, 
that long of a period of time, but it, we took that, we needed that time and we could talk more. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Ariel. I'll be calling on you again. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you everyone. And thank you for the public for sharing.